Welcome to the Fittest in Media Expert Interview Series. Ashoka Changemakers, with the support of Google, launched Citizen Media, a global innovation competition to find solutions that use media to catalyze participatory citizenship. In this series, we'll connect with media experts from around the world to explore major trends, obstacles, and what lies ahead. Joining us today, we have Ms. Esther Wojcicki, Vice Chair of the Board of Directors of the Creative Commons and Chairman of the Board of Directors of Learning Matters at PBS. Esther is also one of our judges for the Google-supported Citizen Media Competition. Esther, thank you for joining us. Very happy to be here. You've been working at the intersection of technology and education for years now. What piqued your interest in technology and how did you get started? I've been interested in improving education and improving learning in the classroom for a long time. One of the things that has fascinated me for a long time, actually, since college, is how do people learn and why are some methods more effective than other methods? And so when technology arrived in the 19... Well, actually, I first started using it in the 1980s. The question is, like, what could I do with technology that would help me be a better teacher? And so I've been doing all kinds of experiments, and most of them have been pretty successful using technology in the classroom because I find that using computers in the classroom, it's kind of like a magic pencil. The kids get very excited about using technology, and I don't exactly know why, but they do. And so it makes the class in classes really engaging, and it makes my job as a teacher easier because my kids, my students learn more, faster. So that's been actually the main reason that I've been interested in technology and education. Was there anything in particular that you think facilitated the impact that it created? You mentioned how thirsty children are for this integration of technology and the excitement around using it. Is it just the technology, you think, or is there something something else going on there? My theory is that kids are always interested in, in learning. They're really curious. And then, unfortunately, the school system has a negative impact on them. And so the school system, it eliminates a lot of natural curiosity because kids are told what to learn, what to study. They are given no opportunity for input. And as a result, you know, a lot of kids sort of lose enthusiasm for learning. And so my whole program is based on what can I do to make learning exciting for kids. And so the main thing that I was looking for at our, you know, variety of tools. It wasn't just that computer, actually, the advent of the computer, but I was always looking for ways to make learning fun. And uh, then I found the computer was really my ally in this because what happens is in my classes, and actually it can happen in a lot of classes where you have project-based education, what happens is that my students can find out a lot of information on their own. They can actually go online. They can research all sorts of topics once they, of course, know how to search, which is something I teach in the class. And then they can share that information with each other and they can share it with me. And so as a result, the class is much more exciting and much more engaging because kids aren't just sitting there listening to me talk. I would, of course, love to think that I'm just the most engaging speaker out there, but let's face it, no speaker can really hold the attention of teenagers for 50 minutes. Actually, it's even hard to hold the attention of any group for that length of time. So when they're actually actually engaged in finding out information themselves, talking to their peers, and working on a project, then learning actually takes place. And that's actually the impetus for me wanting to use technology in the classroom. Does that all make sense? I can Absolutely. go into a bit more detail about, for example, years ago, back in the early 1900s, schooling was really for the industrial age. It was like educating people to work in factories and educating people for discipline. And then through the years today, we're not really interested in having students come out of school knowing how to work in a factory because we just don't do that anymore. Well, what we need are really motivated and self-reliant students. And we need kids that are willing to take a risk and to be entrepreneurs and to be able to get along well and collaborate with each other. So the demand for skills has really changed. And so my teaching seems to have fortunately correlated with this demand for the thinking student. Because Mm -hmm. when a student is going online and getting information and then sharing it with the group or with the class, they are actually empowered in their their thinking because they couldn't do it if they weren't. Otherwise, they'd just be sitting there 
anyway, that's just a little addendum. So that hopefully that all makes sense. Absolutely, it does. I would like to switch our focus just slightly from the actual environment of education to the technology and the role of technology here. A few years ago, you worked with Google in designing the Google Teacher Outreach Program. And I'm curious how that opportunity came about and how you've seen it applied. Were there any any significant lessons that you took from that process? So that actually started in 2005, and it was it's the Google Teacher Academy. And the idea was to try to empower teachers and help them be more effective in the classroom. So Google has all these tools, absolutely great tools to help teachers. And at that point, they weren't really being used in the classroom because nobody really had conceptualized it. They were thinking about it. Some, it was kind of sporadic use. And so one of the things that I worked on specifically was called Google Docs and Docs and spreadsheets. And well, today there's, there's other things in there, presentations and forms and so forth. But as an English teacher, what was happening to me in the 1990s is that my students were writing their essays, either in class or at home, and they had all these different versions of Microsoft Word. And the school would have, of course, the older version because they had no money to update. And the kids coming from home would have these newer versions. So they would email their documents or their essays to themselves and at the school, and we couldn't open them up. It would just drive me crazy. It would be all gibberish. Mm-hmm. And then the other thing that would happen is that kids would that, that, that wouldn't open because they hadn't sent it correctly. But then they would have to carry their disk with them and put the document on the disk and then remember to bring the disc and not lose it and make sure it had their name on it. And there were all kinds of issues. And then in about 2005, I discovered this program called Rightly, and that was the forerunner of Google Docs. And then Google bought the company, Rightly, and then turned it into Google Docs. And at that point, I got to know some people at Google, and so then I was hired as a consultant to help teachers or help formulate lesson plans to help teachers use some of these programs. And that's, that's how I actually got started. And so for those of people that don't know about Google Docs, the thing that's great about it is that it's online and the kids can access the same document from home and from school and it's collaborative so they can work in teams. So my entire journalism program works using Google Docs so that editors can edit the students' articles online at any time, day or night, and then they can get feedback and and the writer can comment on their article. There can be a real dialogue. So as you can expect, that really improves student writing and student outcomes. And so the students write. I have many students, more than 70 students in one class, all producing a newspaper. And it's a 28-page section newspaper. And all the documents are turned in online. We can keep track of them. I don't have to worry about different versions of the program. And then also, I don't have to correct them all. Right, the uh, editors, the other students, it's all peer edited. Of course, I also always drop little pearls of wisdom whenever I can, and hopefully they'll follow. But there's a lot of student peer interaction, which makes the program exciting for them. Is there anything that you see that tends to not work when it comes in tech and education? Yes, actually. So a lot of teachers that are using tech in education, unfortunately, what's going on is that they're teaching in the same old model. It's this model of teacher-directed learning, or the one where the teacher is basically in front of the class all the time. And so the way that they're using technology is basically, okay, instead of getting the handout from a book, it's being distributed online, or they take role online, or they collect books and do all the book collections online, or the bulletin is circulated online, or they can send home messages to the parent online. They can keep track of grades online. So you just have to ask yourself, all those things I just mentioned, how does that impact the classroom? How does it make the life of a student any better? What are they learning from that? So I think that that's one of the things. Teachers need to relinquish some control and allow students to participate in the learning process themselves. So if we're like doing a, let's say we're writing an essay on Romeo and Juliet, 
kids can go online. They can find information about Romeo and Juliet. They can find even videos about Romeo and Juliet. There's a lot of information out there that they can then get and share with each other. They can be more active in the process. And I think everyone knows that when you teach someone else something, you know it better than you do if you just are a passive learner. So in the process of finding it and sharing it, they then learn more. Today we have a very, well, it's a standards-based curriculum that is high-stakes testing that forces teachers into preparing students for the high-stakes testing. So they're reluctant to let students actually learn on their own. They want to make sure that they learn what they're supposed to learn so that they'll do well on the high-stakes testing. And because those, those tests, they have a negative impact if the students don't do well. They impact the school. And so mm-hmm. all those teachers are just like, want to be in total control. They don't want to allow students to have any um, control over that. It sounds like the the technology that is least useful is that which essentially is a monologue, the the unidirectional technology that essentially is a different way of lecturing or a technological way of lecturing. Right. It's a different way of doing the stage on the stage. Right. It's, It's basically worksheets. Okay, the worksheets aren't on paper now, they're online. Right. So that's not necessarily the kind of innovation that we'd like to see. What what is useful is the technology that really engages, creates sort of a two-way learning experience and really encourages students to create something out of nothing. Right. So like, for example, have students make videos, you know, post them on YouTube about some of the learning things that they're doing. Or Google has this presentations. It's sort of like PowerPoint, only it's collaborative. So have students work together. That's the advantage of it. They can work together in groups on a presentation, and then they can present to the class. Mm -hmm. So the collaboration is really the key. And I'm not saying that it has to be the whole classroom has to be collaboration all the time, and that we have to get rid of direct instruction. It's just that right now we have like 99% direct instruction and no collaboration time. We need to have some collaboration time in there. So if they had 50% direct instruction and 50% collaboration time, or even even if they only want to do 25%, that would be 25% more than what's happening today. Definitely something to keep in mind. Um, studies show that kids learn the most outside of school. Right. So mm-hmm. if, why do they learn the most outside of school? Because they're tra- talking to each other. Yeah, they're engaged. They're engaged. So I actually, I, I, have, I can now, I've been teaching for so long, I can tell when I'm talking to a group of students, they're all sitting there quietly and they're looking at me. I can tell when they are not there, when they're thinking about what they're going to do this weekend. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And if you just sit there for a while, I mean, just think about yourself. I'm sure that happens to everybody. You know, if you sit there for a long period of time, somebody's talking, you're basically going to disconnect. Absolutely. That's some of my philosophy. It's a very useful perspective. You've spent a great deal of time in the classroom, but really also balance that with some pretty significant experience in the world of emerging technologies. And one of the experiences that you've had is of great interest to me, and that is your experience with Creative Commons. And I'm curious, how does that intersect with your passion for education, the Creative Commons and this emerging online sharing and and almost online collaboration in a sense? So Creative Commons licensing is a way to empower everybody to share. I don't know how many people know about Creative Commons licensing, but Mm -hmm. basically it pre-authorizes an author to allow people to share their work. And there are six different conditions that they can put on this sharing license. And one of them is just by giving attribution. Another one is non-commercial, so they can share it as long as it's not for commercial use. Another one would be share alike. So if you're going to share it after you've used it, make sure you share it alike, like I've done it. And then the fourth one, there's no derivatives. It means that you can, you can share my stuff, but you can't derive new things from it. In other words, you can't modify it. You just have mm-hmm. to keep it the same way. And so those four licenses, though, give permission to people worldwide to be able to use work that has been produced. And it can be written, it can be audio, it can be video, it can be pictures, it can be architectural plans, any of those things. And one of the great advantages is it can be translated. So what most people don't know is that copyright laws in the United States are very very confining and very restricting. So a typical anything, written, video, whatever, is copyrighted automatically. That's the default. It's for 70 years past the death of the author. 70 years. 
So there's a ton of work out there, so much stuff, and nobody can access it because it's all copyrighted. And, you know, you just wonder whether all those people that are no longer alive would like their work just sitting on a dusty shelf somewhere or whether they would still like to have it have an impact. And Creative Commons licensing allows this to have an impact. You, as an author, can pre-authorize your work, and you don't have to do all of it. You can just do, like, one chapter, or you can do, like, one book, and it works to help you get your name out there, to get some publicity for your stuff. For example, Cory Doctorow, he writes all his books with Creative Commons licenses, and people buy them no matter whether they're Creative Commons licensed. You can download them, but you can also order them and get a hard copy of them. Larry Lessig, who's a professor at Harvard, also does the same thing with his book. 400 million images on Flickr and because that have Creative Commons licenses, which means you can use them as long as you attribute them to the people that took them. So this allows all the work to spread, be used, the person gets credit for it, and it empowers students and educators everywhere. For example, MIT OpenCourseWare is Creative Commons licensed, so that means that anybody who wants to can just take a course from MIT and put it on their website. And it's just got a buy license on it, CC buy license, which means that you can can modify it to meet your needs. There are 350 universities in the world that have their courses with Creative Commons licenses on them. So that really is an empowering situation for teachers and students everywhere. And that's how I got involved, actually, because I was really interested in sharing work and using work that had already been out there and wanting to respect copyright. I didn't want to use work that was not pre-authorized. And then, as we all know, writing to somebody and asking them for permission is a long process. <laughs> it's like, I'm just impatient. I didn't want to, you know, it just takes such a long time. By the time you get it, you probably don't want to use it anymore. Right. So. So it helps. To answer most of your questions, or I would be happy to. Absolutely, absolutely. It's really, it's really fascinating to think of. You know, um, Creative Commons is something that I've been following, and the creative licensing conversation has been something I've been interested in for years, and I'm very happy with the way it's been progressing. But education, you know, was certainly not one of the uses that I had thought of. And you know, it's absolutely useful in the classroom. And speaking with you highlights that utility to be able to allow students to really get in there and get their hands dirty with creating and recreating and remixing and reusing. It's been happening for years in the music industry, in the art business, in the field of all creative ventures. And, you know, oftentimes we don't really know where that inspiration comes from, but it might have been a refrain from a classical song that has been reused. I mean, even recently we've seen with Lady Gaga, uh, one of her new songs that came out, as soon as the beat started, everyone thought of Madonna immediately, even my mother. <laughs> <laughs> recognize it as, you know, oh, that's that sounds like Madonna. And it kind of did, but it wasn't really. It was it was remixed and, and you know, Madonna applauded it. She said this is what art is about, reinventing. Yeah, well remixing is really the key, especially in the music area. And it just gives kids so much opportunity to be creative and I mean, talk about engaging. That is just one of the most engaging things you can have for students. I don't know what happens when they turn into teenagers, but somehow all of a sudden music becomes very important. Mm -hmm. And it's a great opportunity. And that's, again, you know, it's, it's great that these licenses are available. Also, the other thing I just wanted to mention is that Creative Commons actually helps people understand copyright because, and it helps teens understand copyright because they know that there's like two pots. There's the open pot with Creative Commons licensing on it, and then there's the closed pot with copyright licenses on it. And so if they have an opportunity to use something and they know what the licensing means, then they actually respects copyright and it respects the Creative Commons license as well and helps kids author attribute that work to whoever it was that created that work. So in the schools, we really need to make sure that kids get that education. We need to help them understand what is Creative Commons and what is copyright and how do you respect the rights of authors. Absolutely. And as things progress technologically and, and in the education field, I'm sure we'll be hearing more about it. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us, Esther. We really look forward to seeing what you do in the future and the great things at Palo Alto High School and, and Creative Commons that you have in store. Pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much for the opportunity and hope to talk to you soon. Absolutely.